Guanxi. Yeah, I think Guanxi is it. There you go. I think it has. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, my name is uh, Krish Ashok. I'm the author of uh, Masala Lab, The Science of Indian Cooking. And I'm here in conversation today with, uh, with Dr. Nandita Ayer. Uh, Dr. Nandita Ayer is a medical doctor, a nutrition expert, and a seasoned columnist. Uh, she's written on nutrition, health, and food for over 15 years is the popular author of the, the blog Saffron Trail, uh, a blog that uh, I have used. And, and I'm famously not a fan of recipes, but it's one of those blogs that I go to you know, for trusted recipes. Uh, and is the best-selling uh, author of the book, Everyday Healthy Vegetarian. She's been featured in and has written for BBC, Vogue, Femina, India Today, among other publications. Her second book, Everyday Superfoods, has launched recently. Uh, Nadita is a student of Hindustani classical music, and uh, it, this is, you know, one of those uh, uh, books. Yeah, as as someone who's not uh, never really read nutrition books ever, um, and as someone who's also always felt that uh, either the science is changing too much, or there's just too much, you know, pseudoscience and new age uh, uh, kind of content on the nutrition side. Uh, I found this book to be a, a pleasant surprise. I found this to be a very readable, non-preachy, um, and kind of really struggling uh, the accurate science without pandering to people who want to go after the new age, uh, oh, this is a superfood, uh, the trendy uh, uh, sort of way of thinking about it, as well as being too academically dry. And I, th I think it really hits that sweet spot. Uh, and I truly think uh, everyone uh, should read this book, uh, available on uh, crossword.in and in the Crossword uh, bookstore. Uh, so I'm going to chat with uh, uh, Nadita here, uh, but before we get into the book um, and get into uh, some of the things she's written about, uh, I want to ask her, uh, tell me a little bit about your, your journey, yeah, your, uh, the fact that you have a medical degree, uh, to then nutrition, uh, to blogging, and then becoming a best-selling published author. Uh, thank you, Ashok, for that uh, really uh, generous introduction. And uh, I'm glad that uh, you liked the book. Uh, so uh, a little bit about my journey. Uh, so I studied, uh, I, I studied science in college. And uh, I think as a 70s kids, a lot of, uh, you know, people who are 70s and 80s kids will identify with the fact that, uh, you know, uh, in our times, if you just got good marks in a subject and you automatically uh, studied, uh, you know, the subject that you got a seat in, uh, and especially if it was uh, medicine or uh, engineering, uh, there was really uh, like uh, no other, you know, people wouldn't uh, uh, think about uh, looking at other options. Like if you got this, then why would you look at something else? So uh, just like that, I studied medicine because I got a, got admission into medicine. Uh, I did have, I did have a flair for the sciences for sure. Uh, right from uh, my early school days. It was one of my favorite subjects. So uh, it was not with regret. I just, I joined and I actually enjoyed uh, the studies also. So it, it was very grueling. And uh, all the hobbies that I had as a child in school, etc., I, I had to give up because uh, medical studies leave absolutely no time to pursue anything else on the side. Um, it's uh, all consuming. And... Um, uh, yeah, so then I, I finished my, uh, uh, once I was done with my final MBBS, like, uh, you know, certain events happen that kind of make you take another path or they just uh, show you another path. I think the first of those events was that uh, being such a good student all through medical college in my final year uh, MBBS, my, uh, I was declared fail in medicine, oh. which was my favorite subject. And, uh, you know, having having been in the 70s and 80s percentile all through uh, medical and suddenly being declared fail was like, I have never, I've never failed any subject until then. And in the final hurdle, when like, that's the all important uh, year of your graduating from medicine. And of course, I knew that there was no possibility of me failing. I had done the exams well. So it was like a double shock. I didn't understand why and how this even happened. And uh, finally, you know, I, of course, I gave my papers for evaluation because there was no, I, I just didn't believe that I could fail a subject that I was good at. And that revaluation took uh, literally uh, five, four to five months, so much so that I had to start studying for the next exam, 
the oh. the re-examination because uh, I can't just sit uh, waiting for this result to come. Like the typical government kind of uh, things taking their own time. And despite me, you know, visiting the university every few couple of weeks and sitting on head, it never happened. And uh, you know, I was all ready. I had studied like, and also medicine is the hugest chunk of final year MBBS. It's like if the entire final MBBS was fifteen hundred marks. Medicine subject alone was five hundred. So one third of the entire curriculum that I had to read, like go through all over again. And uh, I was all set. I had got my exam, uh, you know, like the card. And then uh, two days before that, I get a call from the university saying, "Your pass." Uh, you come here. I'm not putting it in the post because you will not get it before you go for the exam, and uh, that's because I had gone every couple of weeks and befriended everybody in the university, saying, "Where's my paper? Where's my uh, you know reval?" And uh, it, it, I, it was of course a huge sigh of relief because I didn't want to give those exams all over again. It's I, it's a nightmare I still get often, um, you know. So then. Uh, but then you know all, that kind of got me off track because my entire classmates and my group of friends, everybody had moved on to internship while I was still sitting jobless, waiting for my results. Uh, it I kind of you know, being a fast track, I became uh, like an off track uh, person, uh, you know, doing. And then I was all through internship, I was posted single, like on my own to all these places uh, for the different internship assignments because all my group had gone ahead. So I think that was one thing that was a big blow and uh, kind of uh, lost steam in that whole, you know, race to then further do PG, do surgery and other dreams that I had. And I thought this uh, this was very uh, demoralizing. Uh, and then I think the second thing that happened was when I actually finished my internship and I joined an int intensive care unit. There was this massive political uh, riot that happened there and I pretty much escaped from there like a matter of life and death situation and I was happy to get out of there alive and that was another thing that I realized that possibly this kind of stress of medicine is not for I mean the kind of uh, you know side things that happen uh, like pe doctors getting beaten up and uh, you know rioting getting caught in the middle of things where you have no business to get, get getting caught in and that was another thing I think that was the game changer for me because it was like way too stressful I said I can handle uh, the stress of medicine, but I can't handle the allied stress that comes along with this. And then I moved on to uh, healthcare advertising because I, you know, I, I always had that uh, uh, interest in writing and uh, creativity and all, you know, which was kind of taking a backseat during my medical days. And then, like from healthcare advertising, and I started uh, blogging a little later because that's when I actually started cooking a little bit in my late twenties. Uh, like I said, uh, medicine doesn't leave you any time to explore any other creativity or hobbies. And I um, started uh, cooking in my late 20s. And that's when I started documenting my uh, cooking experiments because I was such an intuitive and instinctive cook. I would not know the second time what I made like yesterday. So if I had to repeat a dish, I would never know what went into it. So I thought, okay, let me keep a note. And it's easy to put it on a blog because it's searchable. And if someone wants, I can just give them the link. And I had no idea what food blogging was. So that's how very accidentally I uh, started food blogging. And uh, because of uh, my you know, interest in cooking caught on, and then I said, okay, let me, because of my medical background and my uh, cooking passion, let me also you know, study a higher course in nutrition because it's not a subject that's touched upon much during the medical college days. There's a subject sure. called preventive and social medicine where you learn a little bit. But not really in depth about uh, you know different sure. aspects of uh, nutrition, nutrition and nutrition. Probably at a societal level as opposed to a uh, individual level, yeah. which is what is. Yeah, this. and also uh, also the science of nutrition uh, it changes at a much faster level than even like a surgery could be done pretty much in the same way for a few years. But okay. nutrition science like today, what is a nutrient? Tomorrow it can be like the most anti-nutrient. So you know, the way things evolve, I said, okay, let me study this properly. So I did a course in that. And then that's how this all came together. And I started writing. So then my passion for cooking, and then my writing, and my medical degree and nutrition degree, all of it came together. Uh, you know, it kind of channelized in my blog. And then thanks to my blog, I got a lot of other, I started writing a lot, uh, or like as a freelance writer. And then the book, the first book came about in 2017. And then the second. Sorry for the very long story, no, but no, no, I, I can't. I have to cut it too short. No, absolutely. I, I think it's it's very fascinating and it's very relevant. Uh, 
you know, given the, uh, I think we all grew up as, uh, you know, uh, 80s kids who, who lived in that India that, uh, where you just had to take the career that, that you got an opportunity in, right? Yeah. Not, not something yeah. that you could uh, do. Um, and also it's interesting that you talk about some of those uh, uh, aspects of how sometimes you don't get an opportunity to cook if you're studying medicine. Uh, um, and it's and it's just backbreakingly brutal. Um, and I think you know I, I also um, I particularly appreciate the point about nutrition actually being complicated um, in a world where I think people seek simple answers. Um, and they just want a magic ingredient you know that they could just you know uh, drink or eat and then you know solve all problems. Uh, and, and we have these easy ways in which all of these social media and these messaging apps spread all of this uh, sorts of misinformation. So I think it's a it's a it's a very fascinating journey. And I think it. Uh, it puts you in this sort of right uh, mind space where where you can balance uh, uh, the science, uh, the medicine, and the science uh, along with what is practical and what is doable because you've sort of lived it yourself. Uh, so, with that, I want to sort of get into your book itself, um, Superfoods. Right. So, uh, it's a term that I've been seeing for a while. Uh, it, it's a term that's been around on the internet. Uh, it kind of kind of got popular. I I, I think uh, you know uh, uh, maybe four or five years back. Uh, typically used in the context of uh, things like kale and blueberries and stuff, right? So, which is usually what you sort of see as, oh, this is a superfood and so on. And then more off late, uh, the West seems to have discovered turmeric uh, and and things like, say, you know, moringa. Uh, and so those are now suddenly become uh, superfoods and certain kinds of seeds and acai berries and all those kinds of yeah. fancy ingredients. For some reason, uh, so, uh, but beyond the marketing hype, uh, what, what are superfoods, right? So how how did this book specifically kind of come about? As in my everyday superfoods, right? And and what kind of research, uh, given the sheer volume of uh, misinformation and conflicting information that's out there? So, what was your research methodology in in going about uh, this book? Okay. So, uh, you know, when I was uh, when I started uh, looking at superfoods, uh, I'll answer your question in a like two to three parts. So uh, just talking about the term superfoods itself, uh, in uh, you know uh, the earliest uh, mention of this term, uh, the first mention was uh, in a, a Jamaican uh, newspaper, in which there was a, you know it was an advertisement for wine, and uh, they used the term superfood to market the wine, and. Uh, Somehow they just thought that was catchy, or uh, because uh, I, I don't know in uh, the 1940s and 1930s if they had actually found out that red wine has uh, resveratrol and it's uh, rich in antioxidants. And I don't know what the science, uh, nutrition science situation was then, but that was the earliest uh, mention. And the second uh, earliest mention of it was uh, in 1949. Again, in a Canadian uh, magazine where the term superfood was used to describe a muffin. So maybe wow. they just added some blueberry or bran. I don't know what, what happened to, I mean, what was added to the muffin that they uh, called it a superfood. But, uh, and you can understand that wine and muffin are not the first things that come to our mind when we even think about uh, superfood in today's time. So clearly, uh, they were, they were some. Uh, key marketing uh, you know people behind marketing brains behind uh, uh, you know this whole uh, uh, terminology where they thought that even wine and muffin could be marketed as uh, superfoods and uh, off late of course in the last at least uh, one decade this term has uh, caught on and it's got a lot of uh, uh, mileage and uh, food marketers uh, love to use this up front and center in the labeling of every uh, of product and food, like, you know, say a, a granola bar, which is, uh, say, 100 grams, could have like one gram of turmeric and they'll call it, okay, super food bar. Super food so, enriched. Right. Yeah. So this is, uh, yeah. this is a much abused uh, term in today's times. And, uh, you know, anything that uh, says super food on a packet, is something I would say, please look at it uh, with a lot of suspicion and a healthy dose of, uh, you know, uh, yeah. inquiry as to what is happening here and what's actually in this product. So that's that's the whole uh, thing about uh, superfood uh, currently. The second thing is why this book is, of course, like you started off the talk, there is so much uh, misinformation uh, around uh, nutrition. Uh, and health, of course, at large, but also nutrition, because 
I think anyone and everyone who you know who just experiments a little bit on themselves and then they say, okay, this works. This is the best. Uh, um, you know, this is the best way to lose twenty kilos uh, in one week, or this is the best way to cure cancer. And now to add to all of that insult, there's WhatsApp, which is like a, uh, you know, it's like a forest fire when it comes to spreading this kind of stuff. And even on uh, things like YouTube or uh, Instagram, uh, you know, when uh, these kind of videos are put up, which like completely oversimplify something or offer some very unrealistic solutions to any problem, uh, these are the ones that go viral first because even exactly. the people and us as a society, we don't have the time or we don't have the inclination to invest uh, our uh, thinking into our own health and our own well-being. We just go with somebody says something and it's oversimplified to such an extent that, oh, yeah, that is the best answer. And people just rush behind that. And that's the reason these kind of videos get millions and millions of uh, views. And the whole algorithm is uh, done in such a way that the videos that have got millions of views will be the first to be again shown to more people. Right. I mean, exactly. you know that exactly. uh, better than me. And like when these videos come up on search, they'll have those like 10 million views, 15 million views on their thumbnail. So people will automatically, as you know, so many people have uh, viewed that. Yeah. And that view is kind of taken as a validation and a scientific uh, verification of this whole thing, which is which it is absolutely not, right? Uh, because yeah. uh, if, if it was actually scientifically valid, it would require so much more uh, in-depth understanding. It cannot be explained in a one-minute uh, video for sure. Uh, or even like a 30 second thing on Instagram. And uh, there's, there's so much behind it. And it is so different from person to person. So even if they have done so much research, that same information cannot be true for everybody. And even in my book, I don't claim that everything is good for everyone or, uh, you know, it, it's so personal and nobody other than yourself has the time to figure out what your body is like, what works for yourself. Uh, you know, so that that kind of uh, time and uh, time investment into our own well-being is so important. But this whole uh, clickbait kind of information just tries to oversimplify things and people just jump on the first thing that they see and they believe it. And it's just like a vicious cycle. And it, it used to Absolutely. frustrate me to no end. But then I thought, OK, let me, uh, you know, let me write a book, which is, uh, you know, which I think is a good way to educate people how to even understand these things better. Uh, you know, I don't claim that my book has all the answers uh, for all the you know questions around nutrition, but how to even make sense of these labels, how to make sense of this misinformation, how to be a little bit baseline educated about uh, nutrition such that you can see that if someone is just talking nonsense, you know that that is nonsense. Even if it goes to that level, I'm very happy. So. This is in general, uh, you know, what is superfood by the book, and yeah, and what research went into it. I, like you said, uh, you know, blue big, like any, uh, you see top 10 superfoods, you Google, and you will see like a listicle or you know, like BuzzFeed or anything else. And the top, and it's all like, um, you know, written for an US or a Europe uh, kind of audience. And True. the first thing will be blueberry, uh, which is like, uh, you know, if you have to buy it in India. Uh, which you do get in cities, uh, urban uh, cities, these, I mean, in uh, uh, like metros and stuff these days. And like a small uh, packet of 100 grams is some 400 rupees. So one yeah. is it even, and it's uh, imported from wherever. So it's got a huge carbon footprint. It's got a huge uh, price tag. And is it even possible to consume it uh, every day? And what about the people who are not even in metros? They don't have access to this. And uh, the second, of course, scale, which is, kind of grown locally these days also and uh, you know it is sold by a lot of supermarkets etc so I have nothing against uh, kale and blueberries but this is not the first thing that is easily available to everybody uh, in the country uh, and uh, you know and that's also like uh, people say oh I don't have access to that it's so expensive uh, where will I get it from so I can't include it in my diet so I wanted to give a very accessible kind of a, uh, you know a list or a kind of a, uh, uh, what do you say? I wanted people to know that these are the things that are easily available in your backyard and you can easily uh, get them. Uh, it's not very expensive. So that's that's why the term everyday. 
Now, superfoods, uh, you get all kinds of fancy superfoods, right? But what are the superfoods that you can have every day because it's available, it's local, it's not very expensive, it's very versatile. You can make it in one way today, you can make it in another dish tomorrow. Uh, and you can actually make it a part of your life. And this is what is sustainable in the long run. Because just one day I buy a very expensive blueberry and I made a smoothie out of it. What, right. what about the rest of the days? And uh, health is definitely uh, anything in health and nutrition. You only have to see long term. There's nothing short term and there's no spot benefit about, you know, uh, I just ate this today and I have the benefit today. It's about what you're eating over a long period of time, which is why the term... Absolutely. I often say that the term everyday, like uh, the superfood part is beautifully highlighted here. The everyday is also very, very important in the title of the book. And every chapter conveys that that this is how you, you literally change your whole lifestyle. Uh, it's gradual, it's slow, uh, but it's sustainable. And you can actually uh, continue following these things for the rest of your life. Absolutely. I think I want to, before I get to the next one, I want to sort of... Uh... Uh, summarize some of the really uh, uh, very important things that you said, uh, and also some things that I learned when I sort of read the book. See, so one is, uh, I think, and it's important that people understand that, uh, and as you say in the book, that one is that uh, the content of the internet, anywhere you search, you search on Google, you get on WhatsApp, and so on, all of those have what you call a, a popularity bias in that. Uh, what is shared more is what is more popular. Uh, it's it's not what is more truthful, right? So uh, there was a sort of recent research from MIT that said that uh, that the misinformation travels six times more effectively than verified information or fact checking, right? So it's actually six times harder to fact check misinformation. And I think you know, so that's a, you know, you make a very important point there. I think the second important point uh, about nutrition is the sense of it being personal, highly personal. Right. Uh, you know, you could argue that I think, you know, if, if a surgeon is, you know, sort of cutting into a heart or, uh, or doing something like that, there are still largely lots of similarities between hearts of, you know, most people. Yeah. There may be some variations and so on. Uh, but nutrition, on the other hand, is literally almost unique uh, to every individual. You know, within the same family, somebody eats a ton of food, you know, uh, you know, does not put on weight. And some, the other person in the family is obese. Uh, and it's and we all have such a personal relationship. And I think that that is an important thing that you kind of bring out. Uh, but uh, to your point about uh, uh, this this uh, sense of sort of thinking local, so that it's more practical, uh, that I think is is really really important. And maybe if you could maybe touch upon some examples of uh, rather than blueberry, which you know as you said it has to the carbon footprint of blueberry. And by the way, there's a fascinating behavioral aspect. People who spend a thousand bucks on blueberry and eat it, they psychologically feel okay. I've done my superfood eating part. So now I'm going to compensate by eating something really cheap, low calorie, you know, high calorie, you know, sugary thing. And, and that behavior actually then ends up, you know, counterbalancing. So, you know, maybe give some examples of uh, uh, some, some of these practical uh, locally available superfoods. So um, in this chapter called the Superfood Compendium, I have uh, included uh, 39 uh, uh, local uh, superfoods. Um, now again, uh, why thirty nine? Uh, why not more? Because it's a it's a small book. I cannot uh, include possibly everything. Uh, and uh, these are what I thought that were reasonably available uh, throughout the country. Because see, India also is like it's a country, but it's also like a continent in a way that there are so many different microclimates and so many different regions and cuisines. It's it's not possible that everyone has access to all these. Um, uh, you know, foods like millets grow locally in Karnataka and things like avocados grow in uh, Chikmagalur again in uh, Karnataka. But I can't expect that avocados to be growing in, uh, say, like, a, you know, a city like Delhi or uh, those kind of places. So uh, it kind of, uh, I've tried to include things where people can again pick and choose what is available to them. But largely, I have tried to focus on different regions where, you know, uh, the lakadong uh, turmeric from Meghalaya, or there is the you know uh, uh, amla is uh, in up uh, it's uh, grown uh, heavily uh, so different uh, but, but a lot of these also get transported and they are available to uh, uh, most of us within the country and that's that's how i ended up picking the ingredients one they had to be versatile so that it's not just limited to one particular uh, use then again, that everyday context is lost because it can only be had in one way and you can't really do much with it. 
you can't make it a part of your daily diet and uh, the second uh, thing was that also how much are we able to eat it like you know uh, earlier i had included something like nutmeg now uh, nutmeg is used in very minuscule quantities in food how much can you use so even yeah. though it's very rich in certain uh, nutrients uh, the kind the quantity that we consume doesn't justify me uh, including sure. uh, you know in the thing but then again i used black pepper because uh, it can be used every day in pretty much every savory right. dish and uh, it uh, it enhances the active ingredient in uh, black pepper which is piperine it uh, in, improves the absorption of uh, curcumin which is the active ingredient in turmeric by like, 50x or more so it, it even though you know if even if you eat just turmeric but if you eat turmeric with black pepper you're getting much much more enhanced benefit from the turmeric itself so certain ingredients become very important in this context and of course uh, black pepper can be used uh, every day uh, unlike a nutmeg so you know it was True. like it was like trying to select uh, people for in a job interview like i lined up everything and then i you know uh, researched with the help of uh, uh, papers in medical journals etc that what has what kind of uh, health benefits for our day to day use i'm not looking at very specific niche health benefits again because uh, we are looking at overall good health and uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, benefit right uh, so Absolutely. for like a, like a, like what you say complete well being uh, so uh, lined up all these uh, suspects and uh, try to find out who fits the bill in terms of all these uh, uh, you know criteria that i had lined up and then i picked up 39 out of that so uh, in that uh, you know even uh, when i sat down to write this i didn't i don't i didn't know uh, so much about so many things and like i said it's a constant uh, learning sure. and uh, sure. in during the course of uh, research itself you understand so much so something like uh, amla like everyone knows and especially since covid amla is in like so much demand that oh, yes. people are uh, drinking amla juice amla kada amla smoothie you name it because it is rich in vitamin c and everyone knows that vitamin c is good for immunity and uh, yeah. it's just being uh, uh, people are uh, using it uh, day i mean also in the context of uh, covid and the pandemic which doesn't seem to be you know uh, getting off our backs uh, people have become uh, more and more conscious about uh, eating right. uh, these kind of uh, antioxidant rich immunity boosting uh, yeah. you know super foods and like uh, the the uh, that is the right thing to do because we have to do whatever we can to uh, you know keep our health in good uh, stead because i think we don't know if things are so unpredictable and we need to take care of ourselves so something like amla like yeah. this is the general baseline information everybody has about uh, it being rich in vitamin c good for immunity and etc right uh, but you know the things i realized and also a very uh, you know uh, it kind of made me in all of our culture and our indian uh, way of doing things um, and it, i just it just had a wow effect for me uh, what i what i realized during the course of research i won't say i discovered this because i am sure people know about it see something like amla has a very short uh, season it's available during uh, uh, you know jan or like december or jan and uh, and it's so good and our ancestors obviously knew that it's uh, it's having these kind of uh, benefits for you know uh, it's kind of prevents a cold or it helps in some way they have realized it's good for us and to make sure that the amla lasts for a whole year there are at least at least i know of half a dozen ways in which this amla is preserved with absolutely no technology no gadget nothing fancy no fancy ingredients or gadgets or techniques and uh, you know things like one pickle uh, you know uh, with oil and spices etc lasts for the right. whole year even without refrigeration uh, right. secondly just sun drying amla that's the second way third is preserving it in honey uh, and like many of us uh, many of the people will be aware that honey is one uh, natural food ingredient that will not spoil for thousands of years if you don't put some right. water or something yeah. into it uh, so preserving amla in honey which itself has uh, its own antibacterial properties etc so again this lasts forever then putting it in brine Uh, which it kind of has a short kind of shorter term uh, lasting power as compared to the other things then things like amla supari uh, again using sun drying 
then amla murabba which is again just grating it mixing it with a sugar or jaggery and keeping it in the sun for a few days can last the whole year so i realized that um, uh, you know something simple uh, ingredient like amla short season uh, but people have realized its potential as a super food even in those days and how they have devised uh, simple ways and means to make it last for the whole year and, and in fact i was so fascinated for uh, by that fact and i've actually put a separate box about the preserving uh, the ways that indians preserve amla and um, i i was like totally uh, say wow because this is so fascinating um so this is like a small uh, example of how something local something simple and uh, just using sun using uh, some salts or sugar yeah. or jaggery whatever is available and you know creating a, a situation where something can last for the whole year so uh, absolutely this this is also my discovery during the process and these are things that i've shared in the book also uh, about uh, our local uh, foods and the local ways in which we have been using it absolutely i think it's uh... you know as 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 a general wisdom seems to be that uh, uh, in general when you are if you are sort of uh, looking for ways in which you can preserve you can embrace local superfoods it's better to just look at what your grandmother was doing as opposed to try to find you know internet research on uh, what gadgets can be used to do that but i think one point you mentioned i want to sort of dig into that is this uh, another term that we we've been hearing for far longer actually than superfoods is is the term antioxidant um i i i feel that the average public uh, probably looks at the word antioxidant and goes you know isn't oxygen good for us i mean you know we breathe it and so on um uh, so in the context of food in the context of nutrition in the context of our bodies uh you know what 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 are antioxidants and why why are antioxidants important uh, for for our health okay so uh i'll just try to touch upon this in brief although it's like a very detailed uh, kind of uh, process into this whole thing uh so there is a process called oxidation which happens uh, in our body it happens to food uh this is this is kind of a, a cellular damage which is also natural because uh, as uh, you know as uh, as a part of your general metabolism uh, cells get damaged and new cells uh, grow etc uh, and the cellular damage is caused by something called free radicals now uh, free radicals also naturally occur in the body and free radicals are also important when it comes to uh, your immune response and your body is trying to fight off like a foreign bacteria or a virus or something so uh, free radicals are not entirely bad but when when the when the number of free radicals in the body uh, increases there is more than normal oxidative damage and antioxidants are molecules which uh, which occur in food Uh, uh common examples of antioxidants are vitamin uh, uh, c vitamin e vitamin d is also an antioxidant there's lycopene which occurs in uh, cooked tomatoes and it tomatoes. occurs in watermelon uh, so these are again very powerful uh, antioxidants zinc also has a benefit in this so what happens is these antioxidants are molecules that stabilize the free radicals so it's like uh, what do you say there's a riot it comes and like tries to calm down the crowd and now you know people can disperse off peacefully so this uh, this uh, antioxidant it, it 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 calms down the free radical by donating its own electron to the free radical thereby stabilizing it so the free radical will not cause other damage now this oxidative damage is the basis of a lot of uh, it's a part of aging and wear and tear of course that's how we age that's how our cells age are you know our skin uh, sags and uh, all the signs of visible and invisible signs of aging um, but uh, this uh, oxidative stress also is the reason for chronic diseases uh, that cause you know due to inflammation one is the cardiac disease one is uh, diabetes cancer all these are uh, a result of uh, kind of some kind of oxidative damage so when people are following a very poor diet like a very highly processed uh, food diet uh, when people uh, smoke uh, these uh, already our body has this oxidative damage going on you are just giving it a further push and uh, these things happen at faster rate and at that point your body uh, your general diet or what you are eating every day or the antioxidants that are naturally produced in your body are not enough to it is like the rioting crowd is so much but the police is only few so you can't really help 
so when you eat a diet that is rich uh, like you have a focus and you eat the kind of things that i've listed down in my book uh, where uh, these are all proven antioxidants and you you keep that balance up in a way that you are ready to face uh, free radical damage or ready you can reduce the chronic inflammation going on in your body so that's a simple uh, way to explain it but then again uh, always uh, when when other products start saying that we are antioxidant like suppose your granola bar or your cereal or uh, you know like even your uh, mikchivda or like random stuff that start labeling themselves as antioxidant rich uh, please don't fall for that because uh, you know it's best that you get these from natural uh, sources and also Uh, taking antioxidants as supplements like i'm sure on amazon if you search please don't search but i'm sure you'll find it if you say uh, antioxidant supplements i'm sure you'll find quite a few but even taking too much of a synthetic antioxidant can have other kind of damage uh, in your body so it's a very delicate balance but nobody ever gets damaged by eating enough fruits and vegetables because your body will take what it uh, needs and you don't decide the dosage there it's just that it happens naturally and it's safer and it will eating like nobody ever had a problem eating more vegetables and fruits so uh, and uh, lentils and like our natural foods right so uh, that's the in nutshell all about uh, free radical antioxidants and uh, so there is a reason we do need to eat antioxidant rich food but don't look for it in on supermarket right. shelves or on in supplements right and i think one of the things that you said right so don't you know don't over complicate it just simply just uh, you know uh, don't try to search for antioxidant pills to eat them just eat them in natural sources uh, and so on i i think that sort of you know brings me to uh, another thing that i particularly liked about your book um, and in fact it, it, it is my favorite section of the book you know i think you know uh you know you can always google and find out what superfoods what they contain you can find recipes for them and so on but to me i think the one reason everyone must read this book is is the section that really talks about changing your relationship with food right uh it talks about the mindfulness and what you need to do in order to really think about food in a fundamentally different and a more you know healthy manner right so i want you to talk a little bit about uh, that part i think you know that was one of my favorite sections of the book i think you know i'd like to hear a little bit more about that uh okay so i think mindfulness is something even i personally struggle with and uh, it's not that because i've written it i've got it all sorted but uh, you know our way of life today is such that we are always uh, multitasking uh, you know even uh, when we eat we are either watching something or uh, you know looking at our phone or you know sometimes even before i have my lunch because that's my uh, work break from work i try to you know think about what am i going to watch when i'm eating lunch because that's my kind of screen time there where i can watch something on netflix or youtube or something so even i'm totally guilty of that uh, the thing is when your mind is occupied in uh, watching something uh, one you don't realize uh, how much you have eaten you don't uh, you don't kind of soak in the flavor of the food how it looks how it's tasting how it uh, you know feels in your mouth uh, it becomes a very mechanical process where we just continuously shoving spoon after spoon of food into our mouth and uh, at the end uh, after like that 10 minutes or 15 minutes that you took to eat the food if you think about it you may not even realize how sometimes you will not know how you eaten today's lunch maybe you know because we are so caught up with something else and we've not realized uh, so if we if we don't even remember if we've eaten lunch how are we going to uh, kind of uh, process what's in our food uh, have we eaten you know a balanced diet have we uh, included all the good foods in our uh, plate so that's like much second third level of uh, thinking right so uh, and it also uh, it's been shown that it's it's hugely de-stressing it kind of uh, it uh, it helps combat a lot of uh, food disorder eating disorders when you just sit down with the food focus on it and you know um, uh, you just make it like an experience where you you you're having that shared uh, relationship with your food and you understand better you understand what you're eating you understand what changes you need to make you understand what is the right quantity for you because a lot of times we don't even know what is the quantity that uh, we need you know as a kid i remember uh, you know uh, we used to always have rice for lunch and we uh, i used to sit down with my grandparents and i would tell my grandmother 
I can't take the rice because I don't know how much I eat. I only you will know, so you serve me. So it, at the rice, only my grandma served me because I kind of thought that she knows how much I will eat. So it's like a I don't we don't even know what is the quantity that will fill us up or are we taking too much? Are we taking too little? There are so many. Um, and another level of mindfulness is you know uh, who is cooking the food in the first place, and uh, you know from where have your vegetables come. How did you decide what you want to eat for uh, dinner? Was it some random uh, thought? So there are so many questions you can ask when it comes to um, being mindful about the food we eat. I think it's a huge step in. Um, uh, this will kind of uh, uh, reverse our uh, uh, poor relationship with food, like no other diet book or no other thing can, because it's just being really introspective and uh, uh, just understanding for yourself what is good for you. And that is something you will follow. It's tough to follow if someone puts a few rules on us and says, "Hey, this this, this is your uh, uh, thing. Just do it." Uh, you may do it for one day, two days. Eventually, you say, "Tuck it. I'm not going to, uh, you know, follow this diet or whatever." But when that realization hits, that what is good for you, and uh, how certain foods are helping your body, how certain foods are uh, not helping your body, you will realize what to choose. And uh, this kind of uh, very uh, a deep uh, understanding only you can un you know get it with respect to your food no no third person no book can explain this so i'm just try to give a few steps like a few exercises uh, and a few thoughts that i want to put in the readers mind that uh, you know think about these things and uh, slow down a bit and uh, be a little more mindful about what you eat uh, yeah. and put some more thought into your food because that's the one important thing that's going from the outside world into your body and which affects literally your every cell. So how can you not be so concerned about it? Yeah, yeah. And, and uses most of 60 or most of our the energy that we eat from food goes into digesting food. So, you know, that's the it's the something yeah. that we don't realize. I think that's it's a very important point uh, that you kind of make this relationship with food. Um, and particularly, I think as people who live in urban environments, we seem to have lost that relationship almost a couple of generations ago when we obviously, you know, people who don't, you know, uh, grow crops on their land and so on. And again, in India, we have a complicated setup where it's only a, you know, the only absolutely marginalized in the society who actually know, have a relationship with, with the land and with, with where the food comes from. And literally everyone else is just simply just, you know, consuming. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, one interesting thing, uh, uh, there was this sort of very sort of viral video um, uh, from a year back that talked about how uh, one person wanted to make a sandwich, a chicken sandwich from scratch, meaning that, you know, he couldn't buy anything from a store. So he had to either grow everything um, uh, and so on. Right. So and it, it he realized that it actually took him eight months to do that. And it cost him a thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, and the most expensive part of that was the fact that he had to drive to the sea. Uh, and collect tons of seawater to evaporate it and make salt. Uh, and then it took him about six months to grow the wheat. Uh, uh, and then the hardest part was uh, actually, you know, dealing with the chicken and actually getting the meat and so on. So I think, you know, sometimes we don't realize that uh, uh, asking simple questions like who's making your food and where is your food coming from will, you know, easily, as you rightly say, will change your uh, food habits, your relationship uh, with food. I think, you know, that's a very important point uh, that this book sort of brings up. Uh, and I sort of want to logically extend that to this question, particularly relevant um, in the in the, the in, in the subcontinent, right? On the sort of very tricky uh, subject of uh, you know vegetarianism, veganism, uh, and uh, in some sense the 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 environmental sustainability argument uh, against you know regular consumption of meat versus the versus the more moralistic religious argument uh, for the same and, and the ability for sometimes people to sort of, you know, combine both of these. Uh, what do you think is the is the sensible approach uh, to looking at one's own diet, your culture, your tradition, and so on, and then eating healthily and, and sustainably, you know, given these sort of uh, complications? Yeah, it's a very uh, good question. And I would like this to be more of a discussion than just uh, me sharing my True. thoughts. Uh, see, I think any kind of uh, lobbying or activism is always so extreme. And uh, to find uh, any kind of nuance in that is very difficult. Uh, because uh, 
when someone turns vegan or uh, with due respect to all vegans i have a lot of vegan friends uh, they want to turn everybody vegan and uh, you know everyone becomes a kind of an evangelist for the kind of diet uh, they follow be it a keto diet or be it a vegan diet uh, or uh, you know uh, so anything uh, there is really uh, moderation doesn't catch any eyeballs uh, any more the more polarized your uh, views are and the more polarized your thoughts you get more eyeballs and you get more uh, uh, following uh, for that ideology right because uh, when you are uh, say everything like you know uh, food guru michael pollan says eat uh, mostly uh, eat li- eat eat <laughs> help me with that quote eat a little mostly plants uh, and uh, a kind of i think eat food uh, yeah eat food uh, uh, mostly plants not too much yeah. Yeah. yeah eat food so mostly food. plants not too much so that right. and you know the point about uh, eat food you know and his definition of food being it shouldn't come out of a packet i mean it has mm. to be uh, it has to be an animal or or a plant uh, or yeah. something that you know that comes from nature so that's also the distinction of food itself there it's quite a yeah. so that is like uh, what do you say it's just like a few words but it contains a world of food philosophy uh, in there and you can possibly i mean write volumes on the understanding that one can derive from this very simple sentence so you know any kind of industrial uh, farming or uh, industrial poultry industrial uh, you know uh, what we call animal husbandry is of course uh, bad it's bad for animals it's bad for the land it's bad for the environment it's bad for the person who's eating it because you don't know what kind of uh, you know antibiotics what kind of uh, medications and what uh, even the grass that the uh, the animals have been eating must be grown with pesticides or whatever so it's a complete chemical cocktail that is not however uh, you know you are in pursuit of eating protein in your diet this is not the good kind of protein that anybody should be eating uh, also this is this is what is available more cheap uh you know i think uh, even if you look at a uh, like if you look at a, a well done like a well uh, a good brand of chicken which says it's antibiotic free and whatever it's definitely uh, you know uh, that is going to be more expensive but your regular chicken which is available you know in those cages and it's the industrially uh, farmed poultry that's going to be much cheaper than paneer also so if you look at uh, if you tell somebody who cannot afford another protein source and if you tell them hey you need to eat uh, like a grass fed uh, you know organic uh, free roaming chickens or something like that or eat a plant based food it's not going to be possible so everyone's situation is different and everyone's uh, you know life story is different the economics of it the afford like the affordability what the culture is so i think that that is one thing and it's very ridiculous to kind of generalize and say everybody should be plant based or everybody should uh, eat meat each each person follows their own ideologies that is one uh, secondly when it comes to if if someone can actually afford it and they are concerned about the environment and concerned about their body then you should definitely follow michael pollan's philosophy where you also know that that chicken is coming from uh, you know a, fa- a sensibly fa- uh, you know a place where they're not pushing antibiotics and stuff and you know where it's coming from uh, and you pay a slightly more premium but you eat a little less of it uh, you know that way you compensate you mean everyone may not be able to he- eat huge portions um, and uh, also the thing is uh, you know in uh, smaller villages and stuff we always like when we travel here we will see that there's a small house and there'll be a couple of chickens running around there'll be possibly a goat time goat yeah yard. yes uh, and uh, these chickens first they use for the eggs and once they no longer lay right. eggs this is the same chicken that they will uh, cook it up because literally this is the cycle of life and nothing goes waste exactly. same for the exactly. goat they may use it for the milk and to maybe you know have a couple of other goats and then that goat's life cycle is over and in that kind of situation you are just living one with the land one with uh, you know the cycles of nature you are not literally uh, supporting an industry that is uh, you know that is uh, farming like uh, thousands of goats to each other without any room for breathing or uh, which is just plain animal cruelty and it's also not healthy for the person eating that kind of uh, meat so True. there is so many aspects to this and 
uh, personally uh, i am a vegetarian uh, and uh, you know i i just don't i don't understand i have nothing again I, i i don't have any extreme views on that people should stop eating meat etc but for the good of the planet and for your own good you need to find out the correct sources to uh, if you can afford it and uh, if you are mindful about this you need to find the right sources and uh, you know uh, eat more plants that's definitely uh, it's important for good health and well being right. uh, and right. if you if you still want to con- if you can continue eating meat but eat more responsibly like they say drink responsibly i think eating right. meat is also should be done responsibly so do you are right i mean you know the the interesting you know the, the dilemma obviously in this part of the world is that on the one hand we have a uh, we have a fast growing uh, sort of wealthier part of the population at the top end of the spectrum economic spectrum um that is in many ways sometimes consuming unsustainable protein uh, you know and so on um, and you have the other end of the spectrum where yeah uh, kids are not getting enough protein so there is mal you know it's it's an interesting uh, sort of dilemma right and sometimes i think what ends up happening is uh, that if you then impose the kind of values that you need to impose on the, the top end of the spectrum on people who really need to be getting more protein and they need to be getting it as cheaply as possible and if that is eggs and if that is uh, locally sourced poultry and so on uh, i think we need to the larger structural issue of the fact that industrial farming of animals should not be as cheap as it is okay. so there is a um, and more importantly as a society we need to figure out ways in which we can give uh, sustainable cheap affordable protein to you know poorer children and so on so you know it's it's a it's obviously a tricky issue and i think uh, the important point you make here is one that this is a nuanced issue it's not uh, it's not one where we can just sort of morally grandstand uh, and say oh you know, my diet is more superior morally superior or or bring religion into this uh, at all so yeah. i think you know it's an important point so you know with that uh, i want to sort of there are uh, a couple uh, of question uh, if uh, you would like go through in the yes, in the comment so, section right so well, i was just going to get to the uh, there was this one question from harshil shah on uh, what's the one ingredient um, that has amazed you over the years I'm not sure i have an answer to that i have so many favorites but like i did tell you about the amla preserving story and that's something that uh, recently uh, really uh, you know amazed me and it did have that wow effect where i realized how uh, in indian culture we end up uh, preserving a simple ingredient with absolutely no uh, technology and uh, nothing fancy uh, so that that was one so your question i already answered <laughs> but i have no such uh, like i think the more i uh, discover any ingredient i just love it the more i use it and uh, you know it just uh, everything is great yeah, yeah <laughs> no absolutely i think you know yeah. i guess if you really look at the history and and the stories if you really just dig into how something is grown um, and how it gets to you right i uh, i have a feeling that we'll all be amazed by every ingredient everything you know, absolutely uh, even something as simple as atta uh, from oh the wheat God. plant to 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 it getting to your atta is a phenomenally fascinating process uh, and complex process yeah i'll tell you a simple thing here. you know i was uh, i had this lime uh, plant in my kitchen garden lime bush and uh, Uh, for five years, there was no activity going on, and I was getting like really impatient. I said, "What the hell is happening?" I got this from a very good nursery, and you know, he promised me that I'll get a lot of uh, limes. And uh, it was a morning ritual. I'll make my tea, and I'll go up to my garden, and I'll like inspect the plant. How many flowers? How many? Uh, uh, you know, I, I'll keep checking its progress, literally on a daily basis, as if something is going to change daily. I was so obsessed with having some homegrown limes. and uh, you know after 5 years 5 6 years i started seeing some flowers and then in the first year it gave me some five or six limes that's it then next year it gave me some more and then uh, like last year i had more than hundreds and uh, you know the thing that i realized is that once the small green uh, lime appears it's like literally tinier than a pea uh, like one fourth the size of a green pea and slowly it grows in size and then it will be a full sized green lime and then it takes another few weeks to turn yellow and then you pluck it and then you eat it because the green one is so hard you can't even squeeze it it's uh, kind right. of stony it needs to be a bit ripe so you can squeeze the lime and uh, you know i i put this post on instagram 
I said, how on earth is a lime available for five rupees or less? Because exactly. this kind of patience, uh, you know, the, the it takes like four months to five months from appearance of that tiny little uh, thing on your plant uh, until you are able to pluck it. Like the first time I saw that, I said, wow, in one week I'll have limes. It took four months of waiting. Same Absolutely. for bananas. When I grew bananas at home, I guess how on earth is being sold for 20 bucks? This should be sold oh, yes, for 200 yeah. because the kind exactly. of uh, patience, effort, and stuff that goes in, whether this is not a five buck thing. You know? Exactly. So right. that, that's how amazing it is when you see something grow, you realize that this is not a general, ordinary lime to just squeeze on your uh, bail puri yeah. or something. This is magical. Because yeah, it has or, taken or so much. Yeah, exactly. right. It has taken all of nature's power to make that tiny little thing into a full grown lime right. and then ripen it and then you eat it. And right. because you've not used any chemical uh, fertilizers, you've not used any ripening agents, it takes its own sweet time. And that is Absolutely. nature. It's it's yeah. an exercise for patients trying to grow anything. And yeah. like you said, this is the every ingredient I've grown in my garden, I've like been thinking this is a miracle. Because it, I mean, it, my, it is a miracle. You know, my favorite is actually uh, sugar cane uh, because you know uh, today we just take sugar for granted, right? It's just so you know it's cheap and it's it's absolutely essential. Cheap. We buy yeah. it in like kilograms. Yeah. Uh, the, the sugar cane plant is a notoriously hard plant to and hard grass to deal with. I mean the, the leaves yeah. uh, are so sharp. Uh, you know the, the guys who actually harvest them wear they wear like you know sacks. So that it, it's almost as sharp as a machete. I mean, like literally just slice your, uh, that's how sharp the... the it, yeah. It's such a tough thing that it gave rise to this whole indentured uh, laborers. Uh, Slavery. It going is, it is all over sugar. to the plantations right. in Mauritius yeah, yeah. and places like these too, because yeah. Indian labor yeah. was cheap. And, and it was exactly. heartbreaking when I heard these stories and when I saw Absolutely. these things, when I traveled to Mauritius recently, and that's when I dug deeper. And, yeah. uh, you know, you get a flavor of that in some of Amitav Ghosh's uh, novels as exactly. well. Right. And yeah. you guys, this is the kind of effort that went into making sugar. People became slaves. And you're getting exactly. it for 50 bucks a kilo in your uh, swiggy in half an hour. I mean, exactly. that kind of shocks yeah. you, you know. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it, literally it drove colonialism. It, 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 it essentially drove uh, literally all the last 400 years. Sugar has been at the center of literally every bad thing that has happened uh, to poorer parts of the world, like Asia, uh, I mean, it used to be richer, but then, you know, impoverished simply thanks to uh, the power of uh, sugar. It's actually, you know, very interesting. I think, you know, you, you make this great point that building this relationship uh, with food is is such an uh, such an important thing, uh, and I think it sort of makes you more mindful. Uh, I think you naturally, if you know the story of sugar, you'll probably eat a lot less of it, which is anyway I think a good thing uh, in some sense. So with that, I think you know, as we kind of get to the art, I want to uh, I do want to uh, sort of ask you this question on so what's next, right? You've had everyday um, healthy vegetarian and now everyday superfoods. What's the third? What's the trilogy? What's the next everyday uh, uh, book if you will? Um, next is not an everyday thing. I'm working on a couple yeah. of books right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, maybe the trilogy will be completed later. later <laughs> I don't yes. know. Yes. Yes. But uh, there are a couple of books in the pipeline. And uh, while these uh, book promotions happen, I'm facing those deadlines on the other end. And uh, uh, yeah, so it's an interesting process. And I also want to explore some like my first book was mostly about cooking. The second one is more about nutrition. So it, it kind of gets monotonous if I keep focusing on the same thing again and again. You also need a break from those same topics to come back and look at it with fresh eyes. And, uh, you know, uh, so yeah, so it, I, I'll announce it when I announce it. <laughs> I'm not in a position to announce it right now. But, you know, before uh, people go, I want to say this is the book. And... Uh, uh, you can get it on Crossword uh, Bookstore. Uh, you will yeah. find the link uh, in the comments, uh, both online as well as in bookstores. So uh, stay safe. If you can't travel out, please buy it online. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would love to know what you guys think uh, of my book. Um, so this is in brief. And uh, yeah, if there are any other questions or anything Thanks. else that you have to say. So it was uh, fantastic uh, chatting with you. 
and i think uh, uh, the book is very insightful uh, and i think uh, far more insightful than i than i generally expected the average sort of nutrition book to be about and i think uh, the the key things that i learned particularly the, the mindfulness and the changing your relationship to food uh, so that by itself solves half the problem you know behavior and uh, is half the problem it's not what you put in all the stuff that you do before you put it in is is really half the problem and i think uh, and also this fact that you know food superfoods are all all around you like you know if you we've, we've, we've listed amla we've listed uh, uh, even things like tomatoes you know and yeah. lycopene you spoke about lycopene uh, and so on so there are all day to day things even onion you. basically even onion and garlic you know right there yeah, is which is every day, day right yeah. yeah every day three times a day yeah yeah so so i think you know that that uh, um, and essentially also thinking about the sustainability thinking about uh the impact on the planet uh, and so on i think it's uh, i think it's a wonderful message overall so uh, it was a, a pleasure chatting with you same here thank you for uh, asking me some questions that really made me think and uh, thanks for thanks to crossword for organizing this and my publishers at bloomsbury india and uh, thank you your all of you who tuned in on a weekend uh, evening to uh, listen to us chat and uh, do check my book out and uh, see you around see you bye bye bye